All right, we'll get, we're going to get started now with the second presentation. My name is Christian Kalen. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Thanks so much to Eddie for getting this all together for the initiative, for Kevin and Kitty, too, for the initiative um, being put together. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here from Washington. I'm, uh, I guess, technically a native California. I, I was born in Walnut Creek, so I, I, I tend to think of myself as a Californian as well, even though we live in Washington. We've been out there for about 15 years. The, the, uh, first off, actually, I kind of wanted to ask a couple questions. I'm normally used to having this in more of like a university setting or a smaller class size where I can kind of have a discussion. This is kind of a smaller class size. I'd like to kind of integrate everybody else into the discussion as well if possible. So, but I do have a ton of slides that I need to get through and I don't want to bore everyone and get uh, elaborate too much into everything because I have a lot of stuff to show you today. But I just, as a raise of hands, uh, I wanted to see how many people like mushrooms in general. And they don't have to be any type of mushroom, but I. I figured we'd have some mushroom lovers that would come out tonight. Um, how many people have actually, if you don't mind raising your hand, experimented with uh, psychedelic or hallucinogenic mushrooms? Okay, great, excellent. I, 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 I have as well, and I'm, I'm here to tell about it. So, um, It's kind of a new thing for me, though, because for so long, we, we wanted to legitimize ourselves as a mushroom farm. And the first thing that people think, generally, is, well, what kind of mushrooms, you know? So uh, it's, it's been a really rough go for people that have wanted to be in the mushroom industry and um, see every mushroom as magic, basically, and, and want to educate people and not necessarily, like, turn their backs to the psilocybin mushroom, but legitimize themselves in the world where that's what most people think about as far as mushrooms. So I'm here today to hopefully educate and, and bring more awareness to the fact that all mushrooms are actually magic and they are integrated so heavily and deeply into our society, into our world, in, in our psyche, and everything. That um, I, It's just an amazing thing. I, I love blowing people away. I like tripping people out without ever even giving them any kind of substance whatsoever because to me, all, mag all mushrooms are magic and um, just understanding how integrated they are, it, it just it blows me away. So my, my kids, my family think I'm a little crazy. I mean, most of these mushroom people out there are a little on the spectrum, potentially. That, that's just all they think about is mushrooms. And I'm, I guess, one of those people. So um, part of my presentation today was to show how energy flows, like the basic fundamentals of our world. Um, Energy flows in these directions, and I'll show you here in just a minute um, how archetypical, to use a Carl Jung term, uh, mushrooms are, mycelium and mushrooms. How about a raise of hand, how many people know what mycelium is? Okay, cool. Mo the majority of people do. Um, we'll talk more about that. I, I can't remember who the artist is. This is, uh, I think, from Deviant Art online. I really like the mushroom shape. Um, Whenever you see one-legged individuals or one-eyed individuals in folklore, a lot of times that relates to the mushroom. So we'll talk more about symbolism. But I really like this mushroom shape with all kinds of masks. Uh, who are we? Who, who do we think we are individually? Who do we think we are as a culture, as a society? What kind of direction are we going to understand ourselves? How do we feel about healthcare, our food systems, our drug policies. This is all integrated together. This was where I had um, my awakening back in 95. It's called Goblin Valley in Utah. And I didn't know what I was going to get into. I went down there as a, on a camping trip, actually, with a few friends. And um, I I took a heroic dose, I guess you could say. Um, and before we could make, we thought we would eat the mushrooms and then cook dinner for some reason. <laughs> and uh, so my buddy's uh, cooking dinner and he just starts laughing and he couldn't keep it together and he took off into this labyrinth 
of stone figures, Goblin Valley. And it took about 10 or 15 minutes before I just had to go follow him and find out where he was. And we left the other two people behind that decided not to take them with us. And it took me another, what seemed to be a half an hour later, I finally found him in the labyrinth of this valley. And he said, I found the secret to Goblin Valley. These are their homes. And it just, it, it was this crazy experience. But the night was starting to turn to, or the day was starting to turn to night. And I ended up basically just curling up in my tent and not knowing where I was. I was just one with the universe, basically. And everybody has their own experience of this. Everyone's a little different as far as their experience and what they might perceive or feel or understand. But this just blew my mind away completely. I grew up in Utah uh, in a Mormon family. I'm recover a recovered Mormon now. <laughs> Uh, so super strict Christian values, uh, it just wiped them all. I, it, it was like something that I had experienced before I was yearning for, and it seemed so, just so real and, and uh, something tangible, like all these religions were actually trying to find the same thing that I was experiencing, and they were just seeing it as a representation or a symbolic thing. So after this experience, I just I couldn't believe that an organism could do this to me. One, you know, one tiny thing that's all dried up and shriveled, and so I started seeing mushrooms everywhere. So I, you know, whether or not you believe in outer space, uh, what what's out there, I you know, you see the nebulas with the mushrooms, maybe even crop circle mushrooms. Who knows uh, the validity of the crop circle situation? I'll, I'll leave you to determine that for yourselves. Of course, they don't call this a nuclear explosion, per se. They call this a mushroom cloud. So how does, why does it form a mushroom? Shoot. Um, I apologize. I, I was um, editing some of this on the way, and I feel like some of these got turned around a little bit. Um, I like to see uh, different cultures using, potentially this was, who knows uh, on Easter Island what these uh, statues actually were um, symbolizing. But if you look at the face, the nose is the stem, the eyebrow is definitely some kind of a cap, potentially. I'm not saying that this is for sure. I just, I see, I like to see mushroom shapes and all kinds of things. Uh, I, I, saw, uh, I saw this decal and I, I photoshopped it myself because I, just, I couldn't, it was undeniable, you know, when I saw it on the back of somebody's bumper. SpongeBob, every time I see SpongeBob, this little sponge that's technically like a mushroom sponge lives under the water, well water and you know, we're basically 80-90% water. And look at his arms, his arms are basically caps with stems in them. <laughs> Keys that unlock doors, you know, what? Cathedral doors, you can see, uh, pretty obvious there. So here's mycelium. Most of us know what mycelium is. This is the network that's underground. We don't usually see this. So it's kind of like the fruit tree that we don't see, and the fruit is the mushroom. So the mushroom is the last reproductive cycle of the mycelium. And not all mycelium fruits into mushrooms. Uh, Paul Stamets, he was super clever in calling his mushroom farm fungi perfecti. Um, Fungi imperfect, I don't produce mushrooms, and fungi perfect, I produce mushrooms. So that's the difference. So also the way energy flows within mycelium. We'll see some different patterns here. Mycelium can hold hundreds of thousands times of its weight, basically. So it, it helps network all the nutrients within the ground to the plants. 
can kind of see the networking from the outer lens, basically, it's the mycelial lens. Mushrooms are very similar to us in ways, although they actually digest their food as they crawl through the ground with enzymes. So they're constantly producing these enzymes that are breaking down everything around them. They're the great decomposers. Lanakea, the supercluster of galaxies that they had just proposed, um, very mycelial looking in outer space. The brain neural network. Cardiovascular circular system of, of our bodies. The fascial tissues that hold our muscles together. <coughs> Lightning, electricity, the Lichtenberg figures that are becoming popular. This is, uh, uh, they basically are hammering electrical impulse through uh, this plastic uh, material. The rivers and valleys. The tree root systems. I see trees at both, the, the tops and the bottoms, very mycelial-like. Cabbage, leaves, systems, the transfer of nutrients, how energy works, spiders, and their, their webs opening up doorways into the unknown. Here's a conifer seedling. The more work that they're doing on the genome, they're finding that all plants basically have at least four to six, seven, maybe even a dozen different species of fungi attached to them, helping them uptake nutrients, holding, securing uh, water, hydration. This is the basic system here. You have the mushroom, which this one is actually representing more of a mycorrhizal species. Myco means fungus, rhizal meaning root, so it has a direct relationship with the trees. I'll, I'll show you later on all the mycorrhizal species that are wild. Those are species that we can't technically cultivate because they have that special relationship with the trees. And they work through the, the root systems, giving the roots all the nutrients that they need from the outer areas of um, all the dying vegetation around them. Here's the basic life cycle of the mushroom. You have uh, sexual the propagation of the spore, uh, both a negative and positive uh, spore have to germinate. Once those germinate, they start forming mycelium through their hyphae um, growing together, causing these knots. Sometimes mushrooms produce these little stones called sclerotia, and other times they produce mushroom bodies, uh, more of an imperfect stage. It's interesting that nuclear explosions, they actually show each explosion um, the size of the mushroom cloud. Um, it, each stage of the explosion, it was a mushroom the whole time. Same with mushrooms. At the very earliest stage of formation of a mushroom, it's, the, it's just like this shape here. It's just microscopic. You can't see it, and it's just expanding constantly once it starts growing. So, you get this primordial formation, the, heads, the cap starts to come out, and then you get the maturation into uh, the spore production, releasing the spores, spores go elsewhere, reproduce, start the cycle over again. The basic mushroom life cycle. It's another shot of the, these are amanitas. It's an illustration about the mycorrhizal relationship with the trees. So there's four basic types of mushrooms, you have the dung lovers, which a lot of the psilocybe species run under. They rely on cows, basically, or other livestock, manure, and they're usually grown, the spores are in the grass, or they are, they're in the root systems, and as the animal eats the grass, then they process it through their system, and through their dung, the, the mushroom fruits from the dung, basically, so they call it coprophilic, or dung lovers. You have the saprophytic type of mushroom that like dead or decaying wood. These are turkey toes. You have grass lovers as well. These are parasols. And then you also have uh, the parasitic varieties like the cordyceps that grow in insects or other types of animals. 
So here's the quintessential mushroom that we see in folklore, cartoons, and such, the Amanita muscaria. It's not part of the Psilocybe genus. I'm not, I'm gonna let Alan talk about the Psilocybe genus because he has uh, more knowledge on the technicalities of all that, but the, the Amanita has a lot of folklore. Yeah, you can see how it looks like a sun, basically. Um, it has a lot of reference and symbolism to sun. Um, we, we have all kinds of churches and different places, um, artwork around the world that shows things like Adam and Eve potentially eating the forbidden fruit representative of the mushroom. Some nice little family of Amanitas. Even uh, religious people will um, look a little bit like it. I mean, even the veil, the veil of the stem, he doesn't have spots on his cap, but that is no denying. <laughs> They're just so beautiful. Russian, uh, Russian folklore, it's the fly agaric. They call him muhamor, which is um, like the deadly fly agaric, or the, they believe basically that each of these spots are where a fly potentially died. So there's really, in different cultures, they name the, the mushrooms according to where they're found or what tree they're near or what their resemblance is in the physical. So I'm going to go through a bunch of wild mushrooms that you can find here in the Pacific, um, on the Pacific, usually north, like Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. This is the Oregon reishi. It's a medicinal mushroom. Usually you cut this into slices and dehydrate it, and then you can steep it in tea to help boost your immune system. So it's a great way to keep cold, the cold and flu away. Oops, sorry. Here's the lobster mushroom. This is an interesting mushroom. It, it actually starts out as the, the mushroom on the left is a rusula. And it is parasitized by a mold called lacto, uh, Hypomyces lactiflorum. And this mushroom becomes this mushroom from a parasitic mold, basically. So this, no one really cares about this mushroom much. You don't harvest it for culinary reasons, although you can eat it. But this, uh, this becomes $17 to $25 a pound, depending on where you live, just because of a mold parasitizing. But that makes sense, because we have cheese and wine and all this stuff that um, through yeast and molds um, become more enhanced. It parasitized my beard one day too. I ate too much of it. Uh, but they get huge, sometimes two to three pounds per mushroom. This is the chicken of the woods, Latiparus sulfurous or conifericola. You'll find this in California a lot of times on eucalyptus. It doesn't look quite as flat and planed out like this one. It does actually have the texture like chicken, unbelievably. But like a lot of other mushrooms, it'll soak up whatever flavors that you cook with it. So, Here's the artist conch, Ganoderma aplanatum, another shelf type mushroom. I have uh, on the back, uh, I have a little uh, signboard back there, and there is a little eyeball looking thing. Uh, the, the mushroom actually, wherever the white is, you can touch it and it turns brown. So that's why they call it the artist conch. There's a lot of artists that do work on the mushroom. Like this here. There's another shot of it. It's another medicinal mushroom. Same type of thing, just cut it up and use it in tea. Here's a huge reishi from China. They get really big depending on where you grow or where you, how, how often people harvest them. It's the cordyceps mushroom with the bugs. Usually you'll find cordyceps, uh, they're all over the world, and you have to hunt for them in the summertime generally. And they're really hard to find because you're literally looking under leaves as you move along. So they're not like this typical mushroom where you see them without even really bending down. You're literally looking under all kinds of leaves and things. So they're pretty difficult to find. Here's a grasshopper. Paul, uh, Paul Stamets, uh, Fungi Perfecta, he, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, um, doing the pesticide research, trying to help. Hopefully, they'll 
loosen up some regulations and allow some of that research to go ahead. So the, the hat that a lot of the mushroom people wear, uh, Fomis fomentarius, you can make leather or felt-like material out of this mushroom here. This was also Fomis fomentarius that helped transport fire from camp to camp way back when to help people uh, travel long distances and still have camp available, stay warm. This is turkey tail. Um, being very like turkey tail, I mean, it'll go anywhere. It pretty much is one of the most prolific uh, types of woody conch mushrooms out there, as well as a lot of research being done on breast cancer as well. Help fight breast cancer. This is a hat made out of turkey tail. So basically, they're taking the turkey tail, putting it in water, blending it up into a fine thing. It's very similar to cotton pressing where they'll screen out the layers out of the water and make paper with it. This is a paper that an artist did, all turkey tail paper. Was that round mushroom hard? Yes, it's like a woody conch it's mushroom. Like mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. They're softer when they're fresh, so you can, they're more pliable and, and you can work with them. <coughs> this is a garicon. It's a perennial polypore woody conch mushroom that is probably one of the more medicinal types. They, they, they found uh, fights all kinds of viruses, bacteria. I have grain spawn that we'll talk about here in just a little bit in cultivation section that hasn't changed in over two years. It almost like mummifies and keeps the grain or whatever it is, antibacterial, antiviral. So there's a lot of amazing preservative properties as well as bacterial and viral fighting properties. Here's a morel mushroom. It's a cute little mouse next to, I, I don't know whose photo that was. These are mycorrhizal as well as saprophytic mushrooms. They'll grow under fir trees, cottonwoods, apple orchards. In the Midwest, people are mushroom lovers in Michigan and Minnesota and Iowa. The, they'll, they'll usually grow on ash and hardwoods out there. So different places around the world, you'll find mushrooms in different habitats. These are f false morels, just to let you know. There are a few look-alikes. The gyromitra is deadly, and the verpa you can eat, but tends to have bacterial, uh, de it's, it decomposes quicker. It's a very light, flaky mushroom, and so people will get sick from the bacteria of it decomposing. It's another shot, the, the mushroom, the morel that you really are searching for, the blonde morels, or the bigger morels. This is the porcini. It's one of my favorites. It grows in Northern California and up north as well, during the, the fall and the spring. It dries really well. You can keep it dehydrated, reconstitute it. This is a chanterelle. It comes in both the golden yellow and the white type. So this is our farm. Uh, the next section here, I just want to talk about cultivation. We're on five acres up in Washington. We moved there primarily, I really wanted to work with Paul Stamets. And so I had taken a beginner seminar from him in 2001 and fell in love with the area and decided just we, uh, my wife and I wanted to move up into the Northwest, and so we went on a whim, not knowing if I was going to get a job or not. And uh, it turned out about six months later, I, I landed the job with Paul. It turned out there was two Christians that ended up being hired, and they, they weren't sure which one they had talked to. And they called me back and told me I didn't get the job initially. And I was super disappointed. But then they called me back five minutes later and said, you were the wrong Christian that we were talking to. So I was like, ah. Uh, and Paul, actually the second Christian ended up getting the job as well about a month later. And Paul really thought that was funny, going around the farm asking, where's the Christians? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, so we have, we're really fortunate to be on five acres up in the forest and near Olympia. Washington, and thanks uh, to Paul for getting us up there. 
I worked with Paul for about three years, and I, I loved what he was doing, and, and I, I loved being there. But I really wanted to do my own thing. And so my wife is a massage therapist, and she was working on someone, and it turned out to be the owner of this 50-acre farm. And they're one of the largest CSA farms in that area. They, they deliver fresh produce from June to October between Seattle and Portland. So they have about 60 different drop sites that they deliver to. So it was a perfect opportunity for us to start a mushroom farm knowing where our market was going to be. So the first year that we sent out our brochure with their CSA program, we got about 75 people to sign up. So that was in 2006. And it's just blossomed from there. We, we've been at the, this is packing the CSA boxes at Helsing Junction Farm, the veggies. They're pretty much, a, uh, they're a trailblazer in the CSA movement because a lot of CSAs just want to grow their own product and sell their own product, but Helsing Junction Farm actually is like a central location for partner, partnering other farms together. So it's like a one-stop shop CSA instead of feeling like you have to be a CSA member at all these different places. You can get all kinds of produce and fresh, freshly made products from one CSA farm delivered under one house. So this is a really amazing opportunity to be a part of that. We're also in the, uh, we've been in the farmer's markets as well. We did the Olympia farmer's market and probably four different markets. That was a great way to meet people and keep educating others about the mushrooms. It was pretty funny to, we, we had a counter pretty much like every day we'd get at least five to six people asking about, you got the good mushrooms under there somewhere? <laughs> but, um, so we'll move on to cultivation here. This is my laboratory. It's just a 12 by 12 space. And these are HEPA filters that keep everything clean. So when you're cultivating mushrooms in vitro, you need to keep everything super sterile. And that's probably the hardest part of the mushroom cultivation world is just keeping things really clean. So we start everything from scratch. I like doing everything myself. So the agar, we sterilize agar, then we put it into plates, and we also put it into test tubes. And this is how we store our cultures, or starter cultures. So you can pretty much start any mushroom from either spore or tissue culture. So spores take longer because there's so much genetic material in the spore. I don't want to get into a detailed thing. Uh, it'll take too long tonight. But if you take a little piece of the inside interior part of a mushroom, you can take any mushroom that's fresh and do this and put it on one of these plates, it'll start to grow the mycelium from that as long as you don't have any contamination. So that's like a clone of that same mushroom. So you're getting exactly what you took that clone from. Whereas if you start with a spore, you t it takes weeks and weeks to really develop the strain to get it to where it'll actually fruit mushrooms because there's so much genetic diversity. So I really recommend first timers to start with clones rather than spore. Uh, you can get lucky a lot of times and get something really aggressive off of a spore, but it's, it's better to start with clones. So once we get that aggressive strain on a plate, then we segment it out and put it into a petri dish, or sorry, into petri dishes, but also um, store it into test tubes. So the, the test tube actually is our cold storage. That goes into the refrigerator for two to five years. And then that's my first generation that's closest to the clone that I can now take that piece out of the refrigerator and start a new plate whenever my plates run out too far out. So I know I'm, I'm throwing a lot of information at everybody here, but you basically want to keep your generations closest to that clone to keep your, your strain super aggressive so it'll continue to fruit mushrooms. So you're constantly labeling each of your dishes. You transfer one plate to another plate, that's another generation. And then you have to do that as well with your other substrates that you're putting it in. We'll talk about that here in just a second. There's one question. I don't mind questions here and there. Um, how long does an agar slate last um, after you, you've had it completely colonized? Okay, yeah. How long does an agar plate last after it's colonized? Generally, it could be upwards of four to five months that you could use that plate. It just depends on 
you usually wrap it with parafilm, but there's still a little breathability with the film around the dish. So it's just a dehydration thing. Some people will fill their plates up a little further, you know, so you have more material to keep it uh, from drying out. But uh, other people will put things in the agar as well. You know, when you do test tubes, if you wanted to keep your test tubes longer, some people put popsicle sticks in their test tubes to give a little woody debris, basically, for the mycelium to grab onto so there's something more substantial than just agar. So, yeah. Is there a big difference between um, the, the yield with a multi-support syringe inoculation versus an agar wedge? Yeah. Well, the spores, it depends if your syringe is a spore or if it's a fragmentation of mycelia, <coughs> of agar mycelium. So if you're dealing with more like just random spores in a sterile syringe, you're not going to yield as much as if you had a super aggressive line on agar that then you fragmented into water and put that in a syringe. Does that make sense? Yeah, is it the same with liquid mycelium? That's basically liquid mycelium is you're just taking an agar plate and then blending it into sterile water. It's like, a, they call it a hyphal fragmentation. What about this, like, a, you took a multi-spore syringe and you inoculated it with honey water to make a liquid mycelium. Would that be the same variability as doing a straight? Higher variability of success, or lower variability of, sorry, there's more variation, so your success rate goes down with spores okay. and up with the clone or of the mycelium itself, because you know that that mycelium is super aggressive. You don't know if that spore is going to actually activate into an aggressive line of mycelium. All right, thanks. So at one time, we could have a, a lot of different varieties. And you can see how I label them. I have species specific, and I just abbreviate them uh, by Latin terms. So this is Agrosvi agarita, which is Piapino. This is uh, Flamulina velotypes. All kinds of different chaga, rishi, maitake, cordyceps, oyster. So, you, you know, you can keep a lot in a small space, uh, especially with test tubes and such. So, and that's my basic setup. I have parafilm. This is a back to incinerator, which is a ceramic core that heats up, so you don't have to have a Bunsen burner with an open flame and everything on there. And I use isopropyl alcohol at 70% to help clean everything, clean your hands, keep everything clean. And I, I put it in this chemical resistant spray bottle to help uh, use it efficiently. You put it in those little squirt bottles and it, you just use way too much. You can see the sealer also. We do the bag technique, so I have an impulse sealer that keeps everything all nice and sealed up. So one more question, yeah? That's a HEPA filter. The, the wood box is two foot by two foot, and I built the box myself. You can buy all the other parts, like the fan and the HEPA filter, for roughly, I want to say, like, close to 300 bucks, potentially, depending on where you buy it from. Okay. Yeah. The other filters are actually OLPA, which are a higher uh, micron, and uh, I just use those to scrub my room, basically, to keep everything really clean. So They don't have enough CFM coming out, the other two to really open the bags out in front of them. So I just open six bags at a time in front of my two by two because the CFMs are like, you know, 250 plus. So you want a lot of airflow coming out. So everything that's dropping over you is being pushed away from your open bags and, and cultures. All right, here's the test tube I was talking about. It was cold. Well, let's kind of skim through these a little bit. So from the agar plates, you go to grain. We sterilize grain, and that's your spawn, basically, what we call spawn. So you can transfer your agar to whatever substrate you're growing on. That's the crucial step. You can't really transfer your agar just straight into whatever manure or grass or whatever you're, you're going into, unless you're doing outside inoculations with already naturalized mycelium that's used to being outside. We're dealing with uh, sterile cultures here, so it's more technical. So I, I take grain. You can take millet, rye grain, any kind of grain that's available to you that's cheap. I find that millet works really good because it's cheaper. And it also is super small, so it tends to disperse. And you get more inoculation points than a thicker, bigger grain. And I, I soak it in water overnight. 
let it hydrate all that water so they don't have excess water. A lot of times people put too much water into things and they get bacterial. I stuff it in a 941 pressure cooker. I get about seven to eight bags, uh, five pound bags in each pressure cooker. I cook them for about four hours at two, 240 ish, 15 psi. I like to cook them a little bit longer just to make sure. Some people just cook them for about three hours or so. This is my little setup outdoors. We, we didn't have any concrete or anything to do our outside work. So we put down these tarps and then I have a stainless steel ta table that we work off of. It doesn't need to be super clean outside though because this is what we're doing to get into the clean space. So this is all dirty work. These three barrels are where I pasteurize. I do ultra pasteurization of my substrate. And I have propane, the cookers under each of these barrels. I take, I'm sorry. yeah. Uh, what kind of pasteurization do you do? I do ultra pasteurizing, which is a longer cook time because I don't have a pressurized system. If I had a pressure cooker that could fill up all the, you know, I could cook 150 bags at a time, then I wouldn't need to cook it so long. So I, I cook this for 12 hours. So that's why they call it ultra pasteurizing. It's so normally in pasteurization. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's just a term. So we're doing sawdust here. We have alder sawdust up in Washington at our disposal. Maybe down here it might be oak or other hardwoods that are more available. You just want to find whatever's cheapest in your area. And I combine it with barley and some people use wheat bran. I use barley and oats that's been ground up. You just need a little bit of carbohydrate to add to the wood source. <coughs> That gives it the nutrient it wants to really burst open and you get better yields that way if you give them the food. So we're basically, <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we're giving it just enough to really vegetate out, and that's a wrong word for mushrooms, but um, <laughs> to, to grow out and, and then feel like it doesn't have enough nutrient and it wants to produce a mushroom. So we're in a sense kind of tricking the mushroom by giving it enough food source but just not quite enough, so it'll produce a mushroom. <clears throat> so off of one wheelbarrow of sawdust, I generally do about 40 bags. <clears throat> These are autoclavable bags that have filter patches, so it allows the breathability of the bag. But right now, we don't seal them. We just get them ready to cook in those barrels, the ultra-pasteurizing. I put a little uh, all-thread or rebar down in the bottom so I can have about eight inches of water at the base of the, each of those barrels, and I'm basically just steaming the barrels. And that's the configuration that I've been able to use to fit 40 bags in a 55-gallon barrel. So each of these little ports kind of have steam coming through, so each of the bags are getting contact. It's not ideal to have two bags touching that tight because it's going to be harder for those to get the core super hot, but you're just trying to sterilize the whole interior of the bag. It usually takes a good 12 hours. So that's a really good way, you know, low-tech way to produce a lot of mushrooms, basically, and that's the reason that we were doing it, because it's really expensive to get a huge autoclave that you walk into. It's, you know, upwards of forty to $50,000 to get a boiler, get an autoclave big enough to do thousands of bags a week. So if you're thinking about doing, I, I heard a, a, one of the questions with Eddie was, is it economical, or what's the economics behind starting a farm? You, you really need to look at your market and see what's in your area and, and what's your ideal of how much work are you willing to put in because any agricultural farming is a lot of work. It has to be a labor of love. So find your little niche. It's hard to say exactly the conversion rate of a five acre farm and how much you could push. It's more how much material are you willing to cook or, or have access. There's other ways besides cooking it. You can cold water pasteurize. There's, there's a lot of different ways to get away from propane and, and actually burning fuels to cook the material. So, one quick question. Have you used the hydrated lime method with cold pasteurization? Yeah, I've experimented a little bit with it, but we've stuck with this system just because we need it to be consistent every time. But it is a great way to get started, I think. And I, there's, I always tell students to push the boundaries. You know, there's always, I love that people are out there experimenting because something might work for you that doesn't work for somebody else or 
you have materials that you have access to that are cheaper than maybe somewhere else too. So, um, coal, any way to get away from burning fossil fuels, I think, is super good. Yeah. Uh, where do you get that barrel? These barrels were actually you can go to breweries, you know, places that process flavorings, you know, any kind of foods, bulk food processing places. Yeah, breweries are a good place. They might charge you 15, 20 bucks for the deposit that they had to pay for the barrel. Yeah. Craigslist. Craigslist. So that's my laboratory there, the 12 by 12 space. I get propane. This is where we're headed to in the future. We built a barn, and those double doors are going to be my new laboratory. So we'll be able to really push a lot of material out. This is me taking the cooked bags into my laboratory. So ideally, you would have some kind of a way to have a, a more tighter looped space where you're not carrying clean bags outside into another clean space. So, but we've been able to make it work. The, the bags kind of seal themselves. So that's one thing. And I try to take the bags into my laboratory while they're still warm. That way, they're, they're going to be fighting whatever pathogens or whatever get in there while they're still warm. So, mm -hmm. so those, are, those are bags that you pasteurize. These are cooked bags. You're about to inoculate with uh, sterilized bags of spawn. Yep, you got it. So I just set them up. I cool them down. You don't want to inoculate them hot. It'll, it'll kill the mycelium in your spawn. So let them cool down for a few hours. Sometimes I'll just leave them overnight and then inoculate them the next day. Got to open them up, mm -hmm. my daughter, my shrimp loompas. <laughs> they uh, uh, are breaking out. Uh, great. No, she. I. Uh, not to get it wrong. We just joke around about that. They, they've helped me in the past, but um, I do most of the work. So. <laughs> she. She's been really great over the years to be my little photo shoot person to help me out. So she was always willing to help out in that regard. She's breaking up sawdust spawn. So you can make spawn out of other materials to help. Grain is expensive, so sawdust isn't. W Paul taught me this at Fungi Perfecti, that you, you can make sawdust spawn for shiitakes or other varieties and pour sawdust into mass amounts of grain. So from one Petri dish, you're, you, you have the potential to produce thousands and thousands of pounds of mushrooms if you do it right. So from one Petri dish, you could inoculate a hundred bags of spawn. From those hundred bags of spawn, you could produce another thousand bags, and then would produce ten thousand pounds. You know, it's just exponential, basically. So once we we break up the spawn back up because it grows and tightens up. So you, you want individual little pieces, and then we pour maybe like an eighth of a cup or smaller sixteenth of a cup. It's not much. It's just a tiny little handful in each bag. Seal them up, shake them, shake it so it disperses the spawn throughout the whole bag. That way you get a nice, even grow out. And then put them up onto racks. We like wired racks because these mushrooms produce heat. They almost instantly are producing heat growing through the substrate. So from there, it takes about 45 days for the bags to look like that. And those are shiitake bags. Once they start to get all brown and, and weird looking, that's actually good. And we put them into a colder space because they're activated by cold temperature. And that's how we get them to pin out and produce even more mushrooms. So there's little technicalities with each mushroom. So I recommend if you want to get into mushroom cultivation, maybe start with one mushroom and really get to know that mushroom and that process. And that will help you um, not get so overburdened with all these different variables that can happen with all the different mushrooms. So uh, that's why mushrooms cost the way they do. Shiitakes cost a little bit more than oysters because they take 45 days just to get to this point. Oysters take about 12 days. So that's quite a difference. <clears throat> From the lab, we'd take it into an incubator like this because we didn't have a big space for our lab. So shipping containers, we're in a port city. So it's, you know, if you live near the coast like we do, it's good idea maybe to get a shipping container that's insulated and you can grow out of it basically. The, I've converted greenhouses into grow spaces. So I just tarp the top to keep the sunlight out. If you can keep the sun out, you keep the heat down. 
You don't want the heat to get up over 80 degrees. It's really basic, 10 foot by 30 foot grow house. I have a basic $500 humidifier. This has a little water port that goes into the back and the fan basically mystifies or, you know, through small little micron pieces of water so you don't get too much water. You, you wouldn't want to set up like a sprinkling system. You really want it atomized uh, water molecules so you don't get oversaturated mushrooms. And then you want really good ventilation. So I, I put a squirrel cage fan in this box and I'm pulling fresh air from outside through a furnace filter to keep the bugs out. And then that presses through the rest of the, the house to keep oxygen flow happening. Mushrooms won't get big if they don't have fresh oxygen. So if you have really long, big stems and small caps, that means you have too much carbon dioxide and not enough oxygen, and vice versa. Uh, if, if you have too much oxygen and not enough, some mushrooms just, they won't grow right either. They, they get all funky, so. Good, good ventilation is key. As well as keeping the insects out. Make sure you use filters. You don't need to use HEPA filters on your grow space because you're not in a sterile space anymore. So I've seen a lot of misinformation out there. Don't buy an expensive HEPA filter for your grow room. It's not necessary. And these are the oyster bags on straw. So we, I showed you the, the sawdust. Now we're going into the oyster realm. Also, we have tree frogs in our area and they're natural pesticides, basically. So we welcome the frogs to, to hang out and eat flies whenever they want to. It's, you're gonna deal with fungus gnats no matter what. But it's all about cycling through your material, keeping it fresh and clean. Here's the shiitake growth. Once the shiitakes are done, I don't keep fruiting them. I just do one harvest, and then I put them outside in a shady spot, and they continue to fruit outside. Because after the first, shiitakes are kind of funny. They like a downtime. So you have to put them in a dormancy, re-soak them, start them over again. Or else they'll just sit, and they'll contaminate and get your grow space all nasty. And so it's best to cycle them through. And I do that by having little outdoor spaces that I can used to continue the fruiting cycle, just to stack them up. They also get UV light, which they're actually getting more vitamin D. They uptake vitamin D through their caps naturally. So there's actually mushroom farms that have uh, like UV boxes with conveyor belts and all their fresh mushrooms go and just for a few seconds get exposed to UV light and then they have vitamin D enriched mushrooms basically from that. So it's kind of interesting. Here's the straw method. Same kind of thing. We're just pasteurizing the straw, but we're not pasteurizing for 12 hours. We're just doing it for about two hours. We, we soak the, the straw to get each piece of straw saturated. And that way the steam will be able to pasteurize the straw better. If we just stuck dry straw in there and steamed it, it wouldn't pasteurize it. Some people soak or boil the straw, but I found if you're doing work by yourself, it's really hard to pull a 55-gallon barrel full of wet straw by yourself out. There might be some creative ways to do it, but I like to steam it because you can just pitch it out. I just use a pitchfork, pitch little sandwich pieces out, get it onto a table, cool it down as quick as you can, and then we use the grain spawn and inoculate the straw and pack it into the bags. Let the bags colonize for about 12 days in a nice, consistent, you know, 70 degrees. And you're not chopping the straw? I did for a while. It just caused such a crazy mess, you know, breathing in all that crazy stuff. There's other ways you can do it. There's like straw choppers and, and all that, but it's just, I just tended to really be gentle with trying, the only reason really to chop straw is it's not gonna destroy your bag as you're trying to put it into the, you know, place it into the bag. So you just, with finesse, you know, just kind of curl it in with your bag. And I, I have no problems whatsoever with it, so. Some straw, and rice straw is the most ideal. You're all really lucky to be close to rice here in the state. We use wheat straw primarily, but you can use oat and barley 
certain straws are a lot more dense and tough and will break bags. You can also, the bag technique, I, I want to get away from bags more. You can use containers that are reusable. I've seen laundry baskets or plastic containers that you can clean and use and keep reusing. So there's other ways to do this for sure. That's oysters on sawdust. Oysters like both straw and sawdust. But shiitakes don't like straw too much. So we just grow oysters on straw. Here's a pink oyster. There's yellow oysters. There's blue oysters, brown oysters, pearl oysters. Oysters are the best mushroom, in my opinion, to start with because they're super fast growing and they teach you a lot about the cultivation of mushrooms, basically. They're, they're one of the easier ones to grow. These, these are lion's mane right next to them. Eddie talked a little bit about lion's mane. We have enoki taki and, and oysters in the mix here. This is another lion's mane. They grow off that same sawdust mix. So we can grow about 10 different mushrooms off that sawdust mix. Man, I'm really, I don't know what happened to the slideshow. I'm sorry. But I was trying to cram as much information as I could in for everybody. This is the plug method. You can have uh, log cultures that you put, basically we, we sterilize the plugs. These are wooden dowels. And you soak them in water, sterilize them just like the grain. And then you put the grain spawn on the dowel. And then it colonizes the dowel. And you can put the dowels into logs, oak, any kind of hardwood. It takes a whole year for the mushroom to grow through the log before you'll see mushrooms. But if every year you did maybe 50 logs, it, they all stack up to um, being about every seven years or so, they'll kind of disintegrate into nothing. So every year, if you do more and more, you're going to stack up hundreds of logs over five, six years. So it's, it's a good way for people to grow. It's probably the best way to grow the most amount of mushrooms in, um, with the, the least amount of equipment, basically. There's some shiitakes fruiting off logs. Some people say the shiitakes on logs taste better than sawdust. Uh, I, I don't see the difference myself. You can also take spawn. This is a fungi perfecti. We did this Namaco strain, and we took sawdust with a bunch of logs and made this big raft and just piled sawdust in between logs, compiled it together. But we gave it so much food that this, this patch actually took a good three years to fruit mushrooms, whereas most people want to have quicker results. So less food, less material, quicker mushrooms, but not as long of a fruiting period down the road. So this probably kept fruiting for years, just because there was so much wood material to go through. We also took maitake blocks, and we buried them in the ground. This is a process that I had learned previous. Stacked them together, and just the, a really shallow trench. Covered them up. This was in the spring, and then in the fall, when the rains started to come, the maitake started to fruit out of the ground. And we actually got bigger, bigger fruit bodies from the maitake from this. Here's my wife, Rhea. That's probably about 15 pounds worth of maitake. One of my favorite strains, too. Super medicinal. Has, it helps boost your T-cell count, so people taking chemotherapy treatment for cancer can really benefit from this mushroom. We also experimented with taking sawdust spawn in our tomato house and laying the, all the sawdust here is oyster spawn, basically. And we had the watering, uh, the watering hoses right there. So every time we watered, we watered the mushrooms. And the golden oysters popped up. So kind of a little symbiotic relationship there in the garden. So there's ways that you can not only cultivate mushrooms, but also remediate soils. So mushrooms are the great remediators and builders of, of soil. So this is something that we did on our property. We didn't have a garden space, and we really wanted to grow vegetables. So we had all this extra mycelial material to deal with. So we built the soils by starting. You can do this at home with cardboard, either with spores or stem butts. 
where you can take pieces of the stem at the base of the stem where the roots come out and put that into wet cardboard and then it'll grow the mycelium out. We did this with little containers too. This is the grain onto wet cardboard. And then you mix that into material that it likes, straw, sawdust, other stuff. And then that grows through. We did coffee grounds as well. And then the oysters grow through the coffee grounds. You can see the different layers of spawn with the coffee. So from the cardboard, just getting rid of grass. You know, there is a need for grass, but why do we need so much grass? Why don't we start growing some things that are actually useful? So I like breaking down grass with the cardboard and using chips that have been mis myceliated with fungus, like you can see here. And then just keep building the, the soils, basically, from the top down. So every year, we just kept throwing thousands and thousands of spent bag bags of mushroom material into our garden space. And they'd fruit mushrooms and decompose and build up the, the soil. So you could see we're, we're transitioning over a few years now. Okay. We used chickens. We used horse manure. Another symbiotic thing, they're uh, caprinus, the inky cap, helping us decompose the the horse manure, I didn't put any mushrooms in there. They just fruited all by themselves. So you can see our garden growing over the years. So they, they're, they're great remediators, basically, uh, helping. We need this the most, basically, in farming. People spend thousands of dollars every year on soil when they could be composting and doing it themselves on their farms through, with mushrooms. In the wintertime, we also inoculate sawdust in the, the pathways with the garden giant, which is a really tasty mushroom. So all the wood, wood chip pathways of our garden have different mushrooms as well. So I'm kind of skimming through this. I, I, I know I probably should close out a little bit. Um, there's different types. I wanted to show some examples of farms around the world. These are wood ear mushrooms that are really popular in Asia. The reishi mushrooms growing off of sawdust. Mor morel mushrooms are kind of hard to see, but morel mushrooms they're cultivating in China. Those are the chanterelle mushrooms. Let's see, oh, I apologize. Some of these were supposed to be in the beginning. That was a little. So that's, that's my hope and dream, basically, is going, uh, hopefully around the world, basically. I want to send this to everybody, the, um, just how amazing mushrooms are in all aspects of our life. That I, they've, they've been here since the beginning. They've come out of the waters with the algae to produce soils out of the hard rock, um, breaking down, miner demineralizing the rock in order to, to bring in the soils. And then over the years, we, be, we basically came from mushrooms. You know, we're all mushrooms. And you can see that in so many different things. That, um, that it, it's just, it, it's hard to just, uh, anyway, I, I get a little choked up about it just because it is my life. I'm just so blessed and thankful that I was able to have the experience that I did in order to be where I am today. And I give it all to the mushrooms and the experience that I had that, that I'm here. And I hope that um, a little bit of that um, can parasitize you and you can ride that mycelial tsunami somewhere else in your own life. So appreciate everybody for coming out. Thanks so much. Thanks.